We have another new game teaser. I'm sure everybody has seen the latest video put out by Netherrealm about the clock and how it skips 12 and goes back to 1, and of course people have their own theories over what it could mean, but what it likely means is, wow, maybe this year we're actually going to be able to make some new game content to dive into. It's certainly been a while. However, as that time is not currently now, I've put together something that's been on my list for a while, and something I've been able to finally revisit after many years. Some of you might have seen the video I made a while back about the NPC characters in Mortal Kombat 9, how the various challenges had non-playable characters that you could fight against, and how different they feel when you access them yourself due to mods. Well, today is the Mortal Kombat X edition of that type of video, and let me tell you, the NPCs in this game are a lot more interesting, but of course, still not playable by any stretch, and accessed via PC mods where I can finally take a deep dive into every single one of them. Most of them being story mode only, where they appear as standalone fights. These are characters in MKX that are so close to being ready or finished and, dare I say, only a stone's throw away from being usable in a real environment, where it almost feels like you've expanded the roster a bit if you added these characters to the fray. Obviously, that isn't quite the case as they don't have the same rules to follow as the actual playable characters, but any Mortal Kombat fan who took a fondness to any of them from MK9 will be pleasantly surprised over what's actually here. These are the end NPCs of Mortal Kombat X, and we look into just how they work on a technical level. I need to set up some expectations before we properly start. These NPCs were in the game specifically for story mode fights, and they were clearly never intended to be used by a human. This is not one of those cases where they have a bunch of new stuff. Many characters you'll see here will have special moves, combo strings, and normals taken right out of MK9 which will be the previous game they appeared in. If you've seen MK11, Sector and Cyrax, you'll kind of already have the idea. I mean, they had the shared moveset from Triborg split into two characters. Nothing they had was new, and it's the same deal here. That said, some of it does function differently, as MKX is mechanically a very different game to MK9, so seeing how these moves function in a new game is still something that I find super interesting. That being said, let's jump into character number one, Sindel. Sindel is really cool to see, but possibly the most broken of the NPCs, and I don't mean that in a balanced sense. I mean, she doesn't quite work and has a lot of combo scaling and some other funny stuff that I'll mention in a minute, while at the same time having some of the scariest tools a player could have in a player versus player setting. Special move-wise, everything with these characters for the most part is tied to down forward or down back. I'm not sure if that has any significance from an AI perspective, but I guess it's not important. Sindel retains a fair few moves that she had in MK9, while missing some others. Projectile-wise, Sindel has a good amount of options. Her standard projectile is fast, does 6% damage, and is a mid, so you can't crouch it. The same applies to the meter burn version, which does 9%. Sindel's low projectile returns, and it still connects as a low. Now, you might be asking what the point of that would be if the other versions are mid, but Sindel's low projectile has always served not only as a projectile, but a mix-up tool for things that end in overhead, or specials that might hit overhead. In this case, her cartwheel, which I'll mention next. So there's a constant overhead low game on the end of everything that the low projectile provides, and it does more damage and knocks down when you meet to burn it, just like Mortal Kombat 9. The projectiles are possible while airborne, and if you're wondering how they work, well it... Oh. 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 No. Yeah, although Sindel can use both projectiles in the air, if the opponent is crouched without blocking, they just miss completely. I told you these characters aren't supposed to be used by humans, didn't I? That said, she can cover various angles with it, and the meter burn fires two at once. So on paper, she has a pretty decent zoning game for an NPC. It's just, you know, try and stop them from neutral ducking, I guess. I don't know. Next up is the cartwheel special. This is an overhead throughout, and it knocks them down. The meter burn version has a different on-hit animation, right out of MK9, and it does extra damage, while at the same time serving as Sindel's armoured option. Not that it would really matter because she's an NPC, but hey, she has armour. And look, it's so much worse than you think, but I'll get to that later. This move being an overhead means that Sindel could use low projectile or overhead at a moment's notice, and throw a 50-50 in your face whenever she wants. On hit, however, this is where Sindel gets a bit more interesting. Scream is her final move, and again, it's the MK9 version, which is 
kind of slow by itself and much faster when you meter burn it for combo possibilities. It's quite tricky to work into some combos here though, as the strings and normals that she has in the NPC form are a bit... I don't know, the gravity on the combo feels like it just wasn't intended to work with Scream too good, and like, can I really complain about that? She's a non-playable character for crying out loud. Her strings are mostly the ones you remember from MK9, but some of them are either different or missing completely. 112 goes into a launcher with generous combo potential afterwards, although it scales really badly. 111 is a fully confirmable string and it starts from a high. Forward 12 is a two hit mid string that again is confirmable, with back 12 starting from a low that launches. Although the combo potential of back 12 is weak mid screen, but stronger in the corner. Her back one is a low, right? But Sindel has tons of overheads, either in strings or to start them. 4-4 is a two-hit overhead that launches, and it's a bit broken here. You can move the moment the string finishes, which skips the recovery animation. It looks really strange when you do it, and it only happens if the string hits. On block, it acts completely normally. It does kind of crack me up though, doing a run after this, and she's just like, bye mate, see you later. Some other strings include 2-1-2, 2-1-3, 312. Sorry for the maths problem here, by the way. It, it's just the commonly used button naming system for NRS. Sindel is, in theory, a pretty alright character. She has some NPC specific stuff where her jump kick follows through with its jump animation instead of getting stuck on them. Her down one is weirdly fast, like, that definitely can't be six frames. She has her own throw animation, which all of the NPCs have, so that's a nice touch. The jump ins feel more like MK11 than MKX because they're mad plus on block due to acting different to the playable characters. But here's the broken thing. Sindel's cartwheel special is insanely plus on block, so much so that this special into down 4 cartwheel is a true block infinite, and the plus frames on the armoured meter burn version are exactly the same. So basically, even outside of the fact that she has 50-50s on tap, this reversal when blocked starts a block infinite that you can't escape without just taking the hit and giving up free damage. It is a classic case of something that's really annoying and definitely busted, but like, she's an NPC, the AI won't do this stuff, so does it really matter? To those of you who liked Sindel in MK9, you'll notice that she's missing her hair whip, some important combo strings, and even her flight, which I can only assume would have been way too much effort to put in there for a character that you're not going to see or use or anything like that, and I understand. Now, Rain is a very different case, where he's genuinely a much more stripped down version of his MK9 self, with almost everything move-wise remaining intact, but not functioning as strongly as they did in the game that these moves are taken from. Roundhouse returns and it still knocks the opponent around the screen for combos, but you can't charge or cancel it this time over, it is just a standalone attack. The attack does lead to some good damage though, as Rain can still get up to around 40% if you spend meter, and he even has pretty impressive meterless damage. The Lightning Strike launches for combos, but can only be used at the very beginning. In Mortal Kombat 9, the Lightning move kind of has its own on-hit animation, so whether you used it early or later in combos, you could still use it for something. But here, Lightning later on just ends the combo straight up. A full screen check it can still be, and mid-screen, Rain can still turn a random Lightning into some kind of combo thanks to Meter Burn Weather Ball. Speaking of which, Weather Ball is here, but you can't guide where the opponent moves while they're stuck inside of it. It acts as a simple stun that, to be fair, can still be used for decent combo damage, but as you've already noticed, all of these moves are a varied form compared to MK9 where he could do a lot more with them. Geyser Kick is a combo ender and it doesn't grant the loops he had in the corner in Mortal Kombat 9, but can still be a nice way to add damage to the end of something. Notably, the meter burn version of this is armoured and it has fast startup, so again, cool to see that even an NPC has some kind of reversal. Now the meter burn roundhouse has armour on it too, but the move is so slow to start up that it just gets chewed up by even the most basic of two hit buttons or strings. Finally, Rain has his teleport, and it again is a neutered version of MK9. The meter burn version doesn't attack them this time round, and Rain can only use it grounded. Believe it or not, he can actually teleport while in the air in MK9, and he can't do that here. 
It looks cool and it's definitely an okay teleport, all things considered, but it pretty much does what it says on the tin. It moves you from one place to another and that's it. In regards to buttons, most of them are still here. 124 is a launcher, standing 4 and 43 still exist, but they're not your ticket to combos like an MK9. That now belongs to 33, a string you would have used much less of in MK9, but you would have had to use it here if the character was ever playable for some reason. Rain's back 2 string, which used to have a mix up on it of overhead launch or low knockdown, is still in MKX, but the overhead is now a mid, so there's no longer a mix up there. The overhead also splats rather than launches, or should I say mid there, it's not an overhead anymore. 2-4 is a go-to string for the NPC rain, as it is the only string that has no gap that allows me to burn lightning on block. 2-4 into this move does a good amount of chip damage on block, and on hit will fully combo into possibly his highest damage. He has various other strings that he had in MK9 as well, but the fact of the matter is, Rain still kind of plays the way he did in MK9, but everything is much worse. The only thing Rain has going for him here is damage. In a very similar sense of a character that retained a lot of MK9 stuff, but is generally worse in every way, is Baraka, who takes after Rain in almost every aspect in regards to his NPC form. And I need to reiterate, these are characters only meant to be fought a tiny amount of times in just the story. So of course, mechanics and the like were not going to be considered when putting them together. They simply needed to just feel like the character when you're facing off against them. Baraka keeps a ton of his specials. In fact, I think he's the only NPC here that keeps pretty much every single one of them. Due to this, he plays the most like MK9 of any of the characters in today's video. Blade Charge is the first, and it's really self-explanatory. It's fast, it moves forward, and it does damage while knocking them down. Meter Burn goes further, and it's armored. It is the exact same as it was in MK9. Blade Spark is Baraka's projectile again, and again, it's pretty much the same. A high normally, and a mid on Meter Burn that does increased damage. The other specials are where it gets more interesting. Blade Spin is still fast on startup, but in Mortal Kombat X will not allow for a combo extender unless you meet a burn. Baraka has some super cool corner combos in MK9 thanks to this move, and it doesn't quite function the same here. The meter burn is the only way Baraka can combo with it, and still, it will only launch them properly if the opponent hasn't used any of the combo gravity before it connects. And this is a problem, because most of Baraka's strings at some point will move them off the ground, making spin not a reliable combo option. It looks cool though, I guess, but that's it. Chop Chop Blades are here, and it's just a combo ender. In Mortal Kombat 9, Baraka can somewhat combo from this with like a down 4 into charge or something, but you can't do any of that here, even with Meter Burn. It simply adds damage. The other blade spin attack Baraka has in MK9 returns in his NPC form, but it suffers the same problem that the other spin has, where it only really works if the opponent is already grounded at the time. It knocks them down normally, and it's supposed to launch on meter burn, but it just doesn't have the same applications that it previously had, and kind of seems more of a visual, yeah, that makes sense for Baraka to have, rather than serving any kind of relatable function from his previous self. This is where NPC Baraka really struggles. One of his biggest issues in MK9 was his combo strings. He had some stuff, but generally had way too slow of startup on many of them to be as useful as he could have been. And while he retains a lot of his moves, like the back 3-1 launcher here, the 2-2-2, which again launches, but it was a different input in MK9, his forward 4-4 launches, and it starts from a mid, so it's pretty much one of the only existing combo extender options in the corner. Everything is just so unbelievably slow, which, to be fair, was slow in MK9 as well. But there's one thing that changed that really hurt, besides the shorter combo possibilities. His forward 2 was an overhead in MK9, and it led to massive corner damage. In MKX, his NPC version has a mid as the forward 2 instead, so there is no more mix-up. So basically, Baraka sort of plays like MK9, but has no mix-up and way smaller combos. 
One thing Baraka does have, which again is more of an NPC thing that most likely just existed because who cares, is the fact that his second blade spin special on meter burn is incredibly plus, which means Baraka can true block string this as long as he has meter for really scary chip damage. But it's all he's got. He can chip you away pretty effectively, but it doesn't make up for the many issues he suffers from outside of that. Baraka, unfortunately, is possibly the weakest of all the NPCs due to just how limited he really is. A final fun fact that I'm going to add here because it would have bugged me if I left it out is that if you use this exact same PC mod to swap one variation to another character, you can actually give NPC Baraka the Tarkatan alien variation. And if you strictly use the arm blade moves like the Wrecker and the improved NJP, Baraka starts to make a lot more sense. I know this isn't technically his variation, but he is Tarkatan and you'd be surprised how well this actually works. Once upon a time, Mortal Kombat X was brand new and there were no DLC characters. But there was still Tanya in her yet-to-be-released form. Now, the NPC Tanya you encountered in the story was incredibly different to what Tanya would eventually become, and this character was actually the only NPC that functioned like a real MKX character, with the exception of our final example, but we'll get to that soon. This is because, at this stage, the NPC version of Tanya was a hybrid between Katana and Melina in regards to normals and combo strings, so a lot of the moves here work as they should. She still had her own specials, however, some of them working very differently to what she would eventually have when Tanya was finally released to the public. First of all, she had a projectile attack that could also be done airborne. Now, the visual effect of these fireballs is actually the Tanya fireball that we now know, but the animation of the startup belonged to the mournful variation of Katana. It's incredibly simple as it deals damage on hit, doing more damage on meter burn. A 6% high standalone and a 10% mid when meter is used. The airborne version has no meter burn, so it is just a basic projectile there. The other two specials are as follows. A forward flip that knocks down by itself and on meter burn will launch for more combo possibilities. And a flip kick that does a lot of damage on its own, with the meter burn version adding an extra fireball for more damage. This flip doesn't really work so well at the end of a combo because the recovery is pretty long. So combos with too many hits ended in this move will be punishable by fast wake-up attacks. In regards to strings and buttons, it very much is a chopped up version of some of the moves that Katana and Melina have. Tanya has the Katana down 1 and down 3. Her down 4 is Melina's down 3. She has Melina's down 2 uppercut. And the combo strings involve many different animations of the other two characters. The important thing here, though, is that they work surprisingly well with the NPC special moves that Tanya has. And although she doesn't really have anything special here, what she has works perfectly fine and there are no complaints to be made. As far as NPCs go in this game, and to be fair, I guess other games as well, NPC Tanya does not do a bad job of playing Mortal Kombat X. She's just an incredibly simple version of a character that would eventually release in full to the community in a big way. And of course, we save the best for last. The final boss character of Mortal Kombat X, Corrupted Shinnok. I didn't mention this character in my competitive history of Shinnok as, well, you can't really use this boss and he's a boss character, so what's the point in mentioning it? But that doesn't apply here, so let's break down just how ridiculous Corrupted Shinnok actually is. First of all, look at the range on that sweep. It's a 9% low and it reaches you on round start. Come on! Back forward one is the chest beam that no doubt hit you a ton when you played this game, including myself. It's ridiculously fast and it restands the opponent on hit. The basic version does 12% damage by itself and the meter burn version is a mid, does 12% damage with a second hit that can't be blocked that does basically another 12%. The restand is insane for this character because if the beam hits later in its animation, Corrupted Shinnok has even more plus frames to work with, which in the corner is a devastating overhead low mix-up. Down forward one is a three hit attack that you actually need to input 112 to finish, including the meter burn version. It doesn't work so well in combos as they do tend to fall out of it, but I imagine it's more of a grounded tool anyway. Down back two is a strike that hits high up in the air. No doubt intended as the character's anti-air, but here's the thing. 
the meter burn version, is unblockable. Now, it does still hit as a high attack, but some characters are so large that their crouched blocking state will still have this move hit them, and that just has boss character written all over it. Speaking of unblockables, Down Forward 2 is a lunge attack that has multiple directions on it and again is unblockable on meter burn, but this meter burn version launches for a combo. The standard version is an overhead that knocks down, but a full combo unblockable pounce whenever you want is all kinds of ridiculous. It gives huge combos in the corner, and mid-screen will still bag good damage because of the range of corrupted Shinnok's projectile. Down Forward 4 is an axe kick that launches for a full combo whenever it connects. It's a great move anyway, but the meter burn version is fully armored, sporting more than one hit's worth, so it's a full combo option as a reversal as well. Back Forward 3 is Shinnok's Shoulder Charge, being the only special move that the standalone character carries over to the boss version. The regular version goes almost full screen, but not quite, but the meter burn version launches and is armored once again. You get good combos in the corner from it, but mid-screen, you can still pick up a projectile. Strings and buttons are where it continues, as Corrupted Shinnok has a true overhead low mix-up at point-blank range. Forward 2 is a launching overhead, and Standing 3 is a low starting, hit confirmable string. This means that Shinnok is able to mix you up at close range, but is covered in armored attacks and has some unblockables that also launch at the cost of meter. This character is absolutely out of this world, but of course he is. He's a boss character that you're never supposed to play as. I can only imagine what this character could do against players if he was ever playable as like a bonus or something, because he has so much of what makes MKX a fast and in-your-face game, but taken to the complete next level. It's been a wild time finding out what he can do, and it's been a long time coming for me. This was the first time I ever actually used Corrupted Shinnok, so I was overall happy with the findings. It was very, very much as expected. And that's it for the NPCs of Mortal Kombat X. It's become a rather common thing that Netherrealm games have these NPCs kicking around in the story or extra modes or something, but it's always a great time figuring out how they actually play. In the case of MKX, I was really surprised with how well they all fit into the basic game, even though some characters are certainly more capable than others. But I hope today has been a fun little dive into a locked away part of Mortal Kombat X's history. Thank you so much for watching. I'm sure myself and everybody else just cannot wait to see what Netherrealm are cooking up next. And God, it can't be too long now, surely. Either way, I cannot wait to start content for a new journey with all of you. And hopefully that wait won't be too long. Take care. See you later. And I'll see you next time.